Good evening, everyone. Uh, if you can't hear me at the back, Peter, let me know. No, um, that's good. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so I'm going to walk you through the slides. Feel free to ask questions. You can wait till the end or any time if uh, that will help you understand the next slides. I, I welcome your, your questions. So what is poet? Poets, you know, uh, some people earlier were saying that that's a very great acronym actually, but uh, it stands for Planar Optoelectronics Technology. Um, it, it is a, a, a great acronym, but it's got everything to do with uh, integrating optical devices and electronic devices that Michael talked about. This is a revolutionary uh, 3.5, uh, which is gallium arsenide in the uh, chemical <coughs> table. Semiconductor process technology. So what this means is um, it's the fabrication process for any electronics devices that is used today in smartphones, computers, tablets, uh, the network, data centers, anything in, in this video camera. So everything today is done with silicon CMOS. CMOS stands for complementary metal oxide semiconductor. Um, our technology is basically a new recipe based on gallium arsenide to fabricate the same kinds of device you have today, but with a lot more performance, like Michael was saying, up to 10x application performance gains. This comes from the fact that we start with gallium arsenide and not silicon to fabricate the device. Up to 90% application power savings. How is that possible? That comes from the fact that we can run the technology in gallium arsenide at much lower voltages. We can run the technology from 0.3 volt to 0.5 volt, where silicon today needs at least 0.8 volt and above. And the power is a function of the square of the voltage. So the square of 0.3 versus the square of 0.8 and above gives you like an 88% power savings right there. The reason why we would want to run applications a little bit higher voltage, like 0.5, would be for performance. The higher the voltage, the more you can crank the speed or the performance of the device. So you have a choice, uh, but basically we offer up to 90% power savings. Even at 0.5% power savings, <coughs> volt, volt for, for example, at 0.5 volt versus silicon, you get a 58% power savings. Um, so when you talk about fabricating computer devices or computer processors that go in data centers, for example, if you could save 50% of the power consumed by processors in data centers today, you'd save so much electricity on a per year basis in terms of OPEX for those, for those data centers, cloud computing applications. This is the value proposition of, of, a, of a technology like Boeing. So these two things are purely on a, based on, on, on the product or, or the, the gas, the gallium arsenide that we use. The next novel thing um, is that we have complementary logic in gallium arsenide. Gallium arsenide has existed for the last 30 years. But for the last 30 years, the industry has only been able to use one type of transistor which is the N-type transistor. For complementary logic to, to work, you need a P-type transistor as well, a positive and a negative. Uh, historically, in gallium arsenide, the P-type transistor was always on, always drawing power, so you could not turn it off and operate it like silicon CMOS. What Dr. Taylor has done is invented a new structure that can produce P and N transistors for high-speed digital devices, P and N transistors for analog devices that we call HBTs, and an optical thyristor that can do uh, lasers and optical devices uh, in the same chip. That brings me to the next point. Our technology enables the integration of analog mixed signal <coughs> high-speed digital and optical components, all on the same device. So just a point on, on this is enabling integration. What does it mean? So 
in, in your smartphone, whatever kind of smartphone you have, Samsung, Apple, or Blackberry, you have about eight or nine analog chips inside your smartphone, and three or four digital, high-speed digital chips that are like computers. Uh, like the A7 processor for Apple, for example, is like a Pentium uh, processors. They're all fabricated today with their specific manufacturing process. They can't do, uh, they can't mix analog with digital today. So our technology could enable companies like Samsung and Apple to start integrating these chips together and have less devices on their bill of material simpler manufacturing and benefiting from uh, you know uh, integration uh, from savings uh, you know power savings and manufacturing savings better yields in, in manufacturing etc and that will deliver smaller phones in the future with the power savings they could either shrink the battery and make the phone thinner or keep the battery the same size and you would only have to charge it maybe once or twice a week instead of every day so lots of uh, potential there. That's just one example of many uh, of where we could use this technology. I'll, uh, I'll walk you through how easy it will be for the industry to adopt our technology. I have a slide on that later. And just a point uh, to mention that we are actively in discussion with the industry. Like Michael said, uh, we have a lot of discussions going on right now with potential customers and potential uh, partners. Michael mentioned that Dr. Taylor, our chief scientist, has spent over 25 years developing this technology already. And over, over time, uh, we've properly patented our technology. So all of the novel inventions, fabrication steps, etc., to take our technology and deliver it to the existing foundries, delivering to existing silicon foundries or gallium arsenide foundries, are properly patented. There's more patents in the work. Uh, with patent spending, <clears throat> we are publicly listed, fully SEC compliant in the U.S. We file our F20, and our lab facility is in Storrs, Connecticut, uh, head office in Toronto, Canada, and we also have an office in San Jose, California. So what industry problem are we solving? Um, over the last uh, many years, you know, companies like Intel, for example, have been shrinking the technology uh, to try to follow Moore's law. Basically, Moore's law is doubling uh, the density of process of uh, semiconductor fabrication process. And at the same time, they were getting <coughs> performance improvements, uh, power improvements, and the likes. And after a while, the, the improvements on power and performance started plateauing, where the, the return on investment on density keeps going up but in terms of performance and, and power, uh, the, it's extremely diminishing return. Uh, now the, uh, you know, the Intels of the world and TSMC global foundries, uh, you know, they, they're working on 14 nanometer technology. Some of you might have heard about that. Uh, and the next steps would be like 10 and 7. With POET technology, we're talking about matching the performance of 14 nanometer 40 nanometer, four zero. Uh, and at 40 nanometer, for example, for customers using the technology, the tape out costs of, a, of developing a new chip, uh, the tape out cost means when you send your design to manufacturing, they have to develop mask sets for the fabrication of your specific device. That tape out cost is about $500,000. At 14 nanometer, that tape out cost is over $10 million. So only a few in the industry can afford to target 14 nanometer technology, like the Intels of the world and Samsung, Apple, maybe Broadcom and Qualcomm. But at, at 40 nanometer, you open up the doors to everybody targeting a technology that can bring them the performance of 14, but at 40 nanometer. On top of that, remember that they can also do integration. They can do high-speed digital, analog, and optical on the same chip. So we're giving them a lot more and performance at a very reasonable manufacturing cost. So that's the industry problem that POET is solving. 
our solution, again, so that at the transistor level, the, the, the transistor itself performs five times better than silicon at the same node. We're projecting to be three to four nodes ahead of silicon. So again, at 40 nanometer, we're projecting performance at, of 14. Uh, but if we were working at a, at a bigger node, like I'm going to talk a lot about 40 nanometer, but our process will work at nodes that are bigger than 40 nanometer, like 130, uh, 180 nanometer for I, Internet of Things devices, for example. And 40 nanometer is not the last node we're going to do, it's just the node that we're working on right now. But once that's done, we're going to go work at 28 nanometer and achieve performance of silicon maybe at 10 nanometer. Okay? So that's not the end of the road, it's just where we're working today at 40 nanometer. So is the end game that you sell your technology to Intel or Samsung? Absolutely. Yeah, but, you know, I'm just trying to clear my head. To say at the exactly end of the day, we want to license our technology yeah. Yeah. to foundries and tier one customers like Apple, Samsung, Broadcom, Mellanox, Qualcomm, companies like that. Um, so they'll give us NRE upfront and royalty payments on a per device fabricated with our technology, similar to how ARM does today with processor cores, NRE plus royalties. We want to do the same thing with process technology and foundry partners. So what you're saying is that you're, you're, the majority of your customers will be the manufacturers of electronic equipment. At the end of the day, yes, but in some cases, they, they're fabulous companies in some case, and they want to access the technology and perhaps gain exclusivity in their market for POET. We've talked about, uh, we, we can integrate uh, novel things, uh, we can integrate optics and electronics together in one die. Uh, we, we've talked about that. When, you, when people hear that we can do optics, in the same device as electronics, one could think about input and output of the device. Right? A lot of people have tried to do this uh, already called silicon photonics. It's basically trying to leave the chip or come into the chip with optical fiber. Okay? That's called silicon photonics. They can't really do it today because silicon cannot laze, it cannot be a laser and emit light. Silicon just can't do that, but gallium arsenide can. So our structure, our basic structure of the optical thyristor can laze, can be an optical driver, and can also be an optical receiver, receive light and, uh, and, and, and bring it into the chip. So we can do edge emitting input output, we can do vertical cavity uh, lasers and receivers, and we can also distribute optical lights inside the chip. Okay, One thing today that's plateaued the performance of processors uh, inside you know computers you can buy today, uh, for the last eight years, maybe if not eight, ten, every time you buy a computer the processor speed plateaus at about three gigahertz, 3.2 gigahertz. If you pay four hundred dollars more you might get 3.6 gigahertz. Uh, for a specific, you know, processor or MacBook Pro or something. What we're talking about with distributing clocks internally with optical signaling is taking that barrier and blow it past 5 gigahertz, 10 gigahertz. The, the problem with distributing a clock electrically uh, or, you know, through wires internally to a processor is it requires uh, you know, uh, kilometers of wiring, believe it or not, and about 30% of the power is used with driving that clocking network really hard at a 3 gigahertz heartbeat to get to all of the leafs that need that clock simultaneously. So at a 3 gigahertz heartbeats, a, device, a signal needs to get to everywhere inside the chip. Doing this optically saves about 70% of that power, which consumes today about 30% of the processor power. So if your processor is 100 watt, to make any, you're spending 30 watts just distributing the clock. 
And doing it optically will save you about 70% of that power. So you're going to save 70% of 30, which is like 21 watt right there that you save just because you're... And you're going to go at 10 gigahertz and not 3. Is this in gas form? Gallium arsenide. So we start with a gallium arsenide wafer, like a, the round piece of material we start with. And then we grow an, something we call an epitaxy. So it's like a series of layers of different material and gas. Once all of our transistors are done, we basically fill the device, we planarize it, and then we put on top of that the metallization layers, like the eight or nine layers. And the fabrication of the transistors is called the front end of line manufacture. So our front end of line is much simpler than silicon, that 14 nanometer, for example. And then the metallization above is the same as silicon. So it's a very similar technology. Our front end of line is simpler, less mask layers, um, two to three times less mask layers than silicon. And then the metallization above is the same. Has, has anybody else been working on this apart from your Dr. Taylor and, and your people? A lot of people in the industry have not been able to do PNN transits. Nobody has been able to do that. Uh, the silicon industry has been trying to use gallium arsenide on silicon to accelerate parts of their circuit uh, today. Like IBM has spent a lot of money on that problem, Intel. Uh, right now we're focusing on, you know, mirroring what you need to replicate high-speed digital devices with uh, IOs, optical IOs, and memory structures. In the future, you know, we can add more sensors, more infrared technology, etc. So we, we also have a roadmap of device innovation that we can keep innovating in our technology and continue uh, you know, on that licensing path. <clears throat> How big is the market? Well, basically our technology is applicable to every area of the semiconductor total available market, which is over $300 billion uh, per year. And here are some of the big areas where we can play, uh, you know, cell phones, PCs, servers, automotive. I haven't mentioned automotive. Uh, we can play there in electric cars, infotainment inside the car, carrying optical signals inside a car, not only for infotainment, but for security purposes. There's a lot of radar uh, technology being developed to try to get like zero collision cars, et cetera. Uh, auto lane detection, uh, auto, auto lane departure detection, et cetera. Uh, tablets, wireless network, internet of things. So we've talked a lot about 40 nanometer against 14 nanometer, <coughs> where you would use that in servers, standards, PCs, and cell phones. But if I take an example of Internet of Things, so people that are doing devices and Internet of Things today are targeting technologies that are more mature and cheaper, like 180 nanometer or 130. So there we could do a poet devices um, today that have better performance and 90% power savings. A lot of those Internet of Things devices are running with a very small battery or a solar cell that sometimes you know, could get less power on, a, on a, a day that doesn't have as much sun, et cetera, with a technology that could save the 90% uh, power. You know, that would be extremely attractive. Uh, all of those technologies have a wireless content and some kind of digital content. Sometimes they have a very small ARM core, like an 8-bit ARM core that doesn't need to run really fast, but it needs to run at a certain speed. With POA technology, you could integrate all of these things together. All of the analog front end, the RF, analog to digital conversion, can all be integrated inside the chip that houses the processor for the input chain from the wireless signal to the digital bits, from the digital bits back to the wireless signal. All can do that in one chip for Internet of Things. Uh, and save you like 90% of the power, because these things don't need to run very fast. Uh, typically, you know, they, they just need a little heartbeat and they check sensors, etc. Uh, so the, these, this is another example of a less leading edge technology where we bring a, a ton of value. Easy industry adoption. So 
for the designers, um, for example, for a designer at uh, uh, at Apple, they, they can continue to design chips the same way they've designed them in the past. They're going to continue writing code the same way they've done and the, the tool chain is being enabled by our team right now, working with Synopsys and their tools uh, to enable you know, those designers to just compile their code that they're writing today, targeting a new technology in the back end, but that's all invisible to them. Okay, so that's very important. Sometimes you know, companies come with a new technology, a new whiz bang technology, but everybody has to change the way they've been doing things for the last 20 years. That doesn't work, right? So keep in mind that they don't have to change the way they're designing the chips. For manufacturing and testing, we've talked, I've talked quite a bit about an easy transition from silicon foundries to a POET flow. Uh, similarly, for someone that would have a gallium arsenide foundry to a POET flow would be fairly seamless. Uh, and we support the same testing infrastructure. Uh, for people that do probing at the wafer level, uh, packaging, you know, probing at the package device, nothing of that needs to change. We talked about uh, the CapEx investment of you know, a 14 nanometer foundry versus 40. Huge difference in investment levels for a POET uh, equivalent process at, at 40 versus 14. Dr. Taylor in his wisdom all the way along has uh, develop poet so that it easily could, uh, you know, work with existing manufacturing equipment in foundries. Yes. But now, as we have become spoiled with these all these innovative products, we want more in the chip, yeah. more in the. I remember that we used to carry a, a briefcase every day, mm -hmm. you know, to work. Mm -hmm. Who carries briefcase these, these days? You carry iPad and just everything is in the iPad, right? Because it can it can capture a lot of information in just iPad or even smart devices. So. People did not work in gallium arsenide. Those who tried, they gave up. The corporate boardrooms, we said, come on, let's focus on silicon, don't waste money. But now we're reaching on the end of silicon life. And I know that going from 14 to 10 is going to be a hell of a challenge. I think once we have this demonstrated from micron to nanometer scale, I mean, people will love it. I mean, I told Priva when he called me six months ago to join the board. Now I want to enjoy my retirement life and uh, one and he told me, I said, wow, I said, why didn't you meet me two years ago? <laughs> and I know that my successor at Grover Honey is saying, Ajit, when are you going to tell me about this technology? You know, but today the companies have invested in 14 nanometer. I think they're going to see the ROI is going to be much more difficult than 14 nanometer. This will become a, a game changer. Have you designed a process to uh, reconvert the old foundries into the modern gallium arsenide foundries? Like I said, you know, the retooling cost is very little. Do you have that as a design? Committee? We have the view that how, can, how it can be done. Okay. And yeah, the machines so are almost actually an interesting product. Yeah. But that actually, right now we're going from working with some partner companies, and they have split it. Well, I think Peter said it right. Uh, by one MBE machine, it just demonstrated that you can now, how many MBE machines need, you know, Extra income stream, that's all. Yeah. So Sorry, that's, just on Thank you, thank you. Those are great uh, clarifications. So, so that brings me to the last step for the OEMs, for the end customers, um, you know, easy industry adoption. They'll they'll enjoy the power savings, like uh, for yeah, for a data center that I used earlier as an example. Uh, they need high performance processors, so they would likely use the, our devices at the highest voltages to get the performance. So they're more likely to look at a 50% power savings rather than 90% because they want to get performance uh, and, and shave a little bit on the power savings. But if you said, you know, today to uh, Amazon, you know, we could save 50% on your server blades, uh, total power of all your processors. They, they'd sign you up, they'd say, where do, where do I sign, right? So uh, the energy savings alone in, in, in these types of applications are, are massive. All of the telecom customers, you know, they, they have existing racks with power cables distributing power to those racks. Most shelves have like a, a 1,000 volt or 2,000, uh, 2,000 watt or 1,000 watt power budget. 
how, how many electronics you can fit <coughs> on that power envelope is huge, right? So if you can double the performance of each card because you're doubling, uh, you're saving 50% on every device, the more the merrier because they can do more, more performance per square foot on their installation. All of these things are, are huge for OPEX for these companies. Uh, integrating lower power manufacturing costs, uh, lo sorry, integration of lower manufacturing costs, that comes from aggregating devices together, smaller bill of material, less devices to manufacture together, less testing, higher yields, and so on. How are we going to monetize the company? I, I, like I said earlier, it's like an ARM model. We will license our process technology for a very high NRE fees up front to companies like Direct Foundries and you know uh, direct customers, perhaps with exclusive rights per market. Once we enable a foundry like TSMC or Global Foundry, etc., they design, they take our process development kit that we've done with uh, Synopsys. They develop libraries that are specific to their flow and their foundry. So they build basically test chips, they measure the performance, and they back annotate the performance in libraries that are then given to the designers to do their device and tape out their chip back to manufacturing. When they give the libraries to their customers, that's a design kit uh, from a foundry perspective. And we would want you know, some royalties on those design kits uh, and then royalties on a per device basis shift from that foundry um, to their customers. Or in the case where we've licensed the technology to an end customer directly, they would give us royalty on a per chip basis that they've enabled in a smartphone or a tablet and the likes. We expect revenue and industry partnership uh, in 2015, so this is something you should look forward to, uh, coming from uh, from Poet. Earlier I talked about the past uh, technical milestones we've achieved uh, in the last uh, three years, uh, and some of those um, were done with, with, with military, for example. Um, which one is it? Uh, Infrared detector array fabrication and validation that was with uh, you know uh, military uh, kind of demonstration and the likes. We demonstrated uh, lasers, PNN, uh, HFETs, uh, and uh, we have our documentation for our, our technology design kit, our process design kits, etc. On the next slide, we have. Excuse me, our technical roadmap for what's happening this year in the first quarter of 2015 and for the remainder of 2015. Like for example, these last two uh, milestones, a 100 nanometer ring oscillator and a 50 gig pixel, those are industry driven milestones for us. So customers and partners we've talked to said, if only you could do this. You know, the ring oscillator, we could compare those results with silicon equivalent results and, and really compare the performance of what you have. And similarly with the 50 gig pixel, there's, you know, leaders in that industry that said, you know, if you could go and, and fabricate this with your process, we'd love to see the performance of that vertical cabin laser. And that would be extremely significant in my industry. So once you have that, come back to us, and uh, we'd love to see what that is. So over time, we've adopted our milestones to what our, our potential customers have fed back to us. Because uh, you know, if you've tracked Poet for the last many years, like Michael has, the milestones that we said we were going to do in the future have changed over time, but that's because we're reacting to what our customers are asking us to do, and that's very significant. In the, I'm not going to go through everything, but you know we talked about on-chip signal distribution. That's one of the things where we're going to work on this year. SRAM structures uh, for memory, etc. 
This is the, our management team. Uh, you know, Peter, Ajit, myself are here. Dr. Taylor, and Dan Desimony, our chief technical officer. Uh, this is the. I think uh, I think it's important to note that that this team has really come together around Jeff Taylor in the last sh short period. Jeff Taylor spent many many years working in his lab, perfecting this technology, but it's just now where we can see commercialization on the horizon that we've managed to attract people like Stefan, people like Ajit, and, and Peter has been a, a, a driving force. Quite frankly, uh, he's done an amazing job at bringing these people together, and the focus, the absolute focus of this company right now is customers and revenue. You know, the Silicon Roadmap is really hitting a brick wall. Like, they're sh they've been shrinking the technology. They're working at 14 nanometers. <coughs> As you mentioned, like, how big uh, an investment w it was to build a fab at, at 14 nanometer. <coughs> Building it new fabs at 10 nanometer will be another incremental on that, on that cost. A lot of people in the industry have doubts whether it will work. It will likely work. It might take longer than they predict. Um, we're in parallel, we're coming with a technology at 40 nanometer that will equal or better what they can do at, at 14 and then eventually 10. So that's, that's one thing. So we're ready at the right time. The industry is already looking at 3.5 material on silicon, unsuccessfully, but they're working on it. So 3.5 is in the language of, of everybody in the silicon industry. They're looking at 3.5. So they're ready for a paradigm shift. When we talk to people, they're like, okay, when we talk to customers, not foundries, they're interested because they want to make sure they will be able to continue to innovate on a platform that will give them better performance than what they're currently developing on. They want to know that they'll be able to bring advantages to their customers going forward. Okay, We're talking about not small increments in power and performance, but huge step functions. We enable uh, new innovations, uh, bringing analog, digital, and optical devices on the same chips will enable architects in the industry to think about devices they never could think about in the past. They'll be able to think of product mix that they never could think about in the past. So they'll innovate in ways that we can't even realize right now. Um, and we're enable system costs, talked a lot about this, and again, uh, revenue expected in 2015. Go ahead, Peter. Yeah, so I think that, you know, to get a clear picture of the balance sheet, we're gonna go back a couple of years ago. And, you know, the company had, was, was doing a lot of stuff in the solar area that was non-poet. Just the, the management at that time was spending a lot of money there. We weren't really spending too much money on poet. I was actually an investor in the company, a good friend of mine had put me into the investment. He was in the investment because Mike had put him in the investment. So one night we had dinner and I said, what are you guys doing with this company? This is a disaster. You guys, I've never seen it. I was in a retirement mode at that time. Uh, you know, fast forward, uh, I ended up going in to have a look under the hood. And I wasn't gonna do anything with the company until I met Dr. Pa uh, Dr. Taylor. He told me about the technology down at UConn and the passion that he had for it. I thought this could really make a difference. And I was at that point in my time, in, in my life, where I want to do things that I think actually make a difference. Not just make money, but make a difference. That's what I think Port can do. It can really make a difference. And uh, we ended up selling solar off, uh, restructuring the company basically. We went from being uh, in debt 10 million uh, to uh, where we are stand today. So I would say by the middle of February, we'll be in the neighborhood of about 16 million in cash. We only burn five hundred thousand dollars a month. Okay, I would anticipate that even if we, when we do our partnership, if the burn rate goes up a little bit, it's not going to go up anywhere near the amount that would go up to that we, you know, have to go to the market for cash right now. Um, we, uh, in, in, Steph talked about some of the partnerships that are due, uh, some of the uh, milestones that are due at the end of the quarter, the fifty gig Vixel, for instance. So that is from a multi-billion dollar company who came to us and said, if you could do this in Poet, we would be really interested in, to, in having serious conversations with you. So we're getting ready to produce that technical milestone at the end of March. I would anticipate that 
that in itself is a great, you know, sort of watershed moment for the company. And then the partnerships that come afterwards would be the start of the moment in time where Poet really goes from just the concept in the fab to actual uh, commercial companies investing their time and energy and money in our company. And I was saying to some gentlemen earlier on that for our first partnership, Sajit and I, we were looking at these companies and we don't need them to write a big check. What we really want them to do is invest 30 or 40 engineers of their time. We need them to invest some of their know-how to partner with our engineers in order to you know, take an end product company and say, we really want to be here in two years and get Poet, Poet to do it. Because after that, basically the world will be our oyster. Every, all the other markets that Poet has will be you know, sort of substantiated with one commercial deal. We anticipate that commercial deal in fiscal 2015. So I think if I had to add another slide, it would be, you know, why invest in Poet, right? That's why you guys are all here. You know, you want to make money, why invest in Poet? You want to be early adopters, uh, you want to be on the cusp of, you know, what's up and coming. I think that's what Poet is. I sat at the other, in my former life, I sat on that side of the table, and I would look at things risk-reward. So what are the biggest impediments to new technology? One, for sure, can it be manufactured? Number two, execution risk. I think the company management has proved that we execute. Number three is the balance sheet. Many companies at this stage just run out of money. It's a great idea, but they don't do it. Number four is the present management team. I think uh, you all should know that Mr. Monancha ran a company, Global Foundries, which is the second biggest uh, foundry in the world till you know, six months ago. We're lucky to have him on board. Companies like us usually have to call the VP of sales and say, you know, can we have a meeting, right? Picks up the phone and talks to all the CEOs. So when Jeff delivers the stuff that we need to be delivered, we can go talk to those people, and we have been. And before he got here, we talked to some of them. Since here, he's been here, we can almost talk to any of them. And I think when you look at the investment, you look at the uniqueness of the management team, the balance sheet, and the technology. And that, to me, is the reason why I think it's a compelling investment. Okay? Why are you described as interim CEO? What's the process there? Yes. Yeah. Well, I'm going to cross it off. Yeah. No. No, I'm not going to cross it off. No, we've gone publicly to we we publicly disclosed that we're looking for a full-time CEO, and the reason is is because the restructuring is done. I'm a capital markets guy. I want to be able to pass that baton on to whoever we think is the right, the right person. You know, that's what true success is, right? When you can say, you know, it, Ajit said one great thing when I met him the very first time. He says, if you can make yourself redundant, you've actually done your job. I'll never forget that because I said he's right. So, you know, in terms of doing these kinds of things, I can always add value to our new CEO. But my job here, for what needs to be done, is done. Now we want to take this company and move it to the next level. I have vested interest for it to succeed. I've got over four million shares. Absolutely, I want it to succeed. Right? You've been so, looking for a year so, for your chief executive. No, we've only really been looking for the new chief executive in the last two or three months. There was more work I had to do in the last year. A lot of the previous guy left about a year ago. Well, yes, he, he's, uh, yes, the PRL. Yes. Yeah, he left a year ago, but we, we didn't have a mandate to replace me until such time as we thought the balance sheet was fixed, and we were over all the sort of hurdles that the company had to be, and we got the right guy in order to pick a CEO. Now we've accomplished all that. So although I was the interim CEO uh, back in January, let's say, it wasn't like we were looking to replace me in the first month, right? We started feeling like it was the right time and place, probably somewhere in the late summer, fall. Now we know it is, because we've got sort of, everything is lined up, all our ducks are lined up. We're also gonna be playing a NASDAQ listing in June, and I would never go with my capital markets experience, I would never go to the NASDAQ unless I had real partnerships in place. I think we're just in the right time and place for, for Poet, and we're really excited about it. Could you say something about your share price movement during the last couple of years? 
the last couple of years. I don't have a, sh a chart of our share price movement, but uh, well, the performance has been very good. Yeah, when I when I was uh, when I joined, it was seventeen cents. Uh, we had a high of uh, two dollars, two dollars and eighty cents, or something. At one point, uh, we had some articles written about us and stuff. Uh, the market thinks ahead, came back down. I think now we're at about a dollar twenty-five, a dollar thirty. We trade literally uh, three, four hundred thousand shares a day. We've done zero marketing for this. You gentlemen, literally, this is the first day that we've started marketing poet. People have asked me in the past, and certainly Mr. White has asked me in the past, come on, Pete, get out on the road and market poet. But I really, uh, I personally, you know, I'm very methodical in the way I want to do things. I wanted to make sure that we had our technical stuff ready, our balance sheet ready, and a real story to tell, and a story that had longevity. Because when you go, when you decide to list to the NASDAQ, you have to have a run up to the NASDAQ, then you have to have coverage, and then you have to have news afterwards. We have to make sure that we have all those things in place if we're doing it. Now we feel we do it. Yes, sorry. Can I ask two questions? First of all, who owns what? And secondly, who, who, who owns what in terms of shareholding? Yes. Do you have big institutional holders? Because the biggest company has one. Yes. We have, uh, we have uh, three Canadian institutions. IBK Capital and their clients own quite a bit of stock. Uh, Pine Tree uh, up in, in yeah. Canada owns quite a bit of stock. Alpha North Investment still owns some stock. I have some European investors who own probably 4% of the company. Um, there's some New York uh, investors that own some percentages, but uh, I would say that maybe 35, 38% of the stuff is institutional and insiders, and the rest is retail. And, and the management? I would say 7 or 8%. So not, not a big amount. Yes. Yeah. And when you go on to NASDAQ, yes. are you contemplating perhaps raising cash there? We may raise cash. Usually, in my experience, in capital market experience, you, when you go on to NASDAQ, you raise a little bit of money because the bankers want to make some money. Yeah. We're not in any need of money, but certainly we can, we can use, we, well, that's, that's the truth. Because I said on that, and so I know I'm being honest. You, you know, you, yes, of course. Right, and you want the sponsorship, and you want the coverage before, you want the coverage after, you want to keep all your investors happy. Um, I'm sure that we'll be able to use the, 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 the the funds of any kind of raising, it will not be substantial. It's not like we're going out there to raise you know, huge amounts of money. It would be something to keep everybody happy, that's all. How come you've got so many shares? Well, when, when uh, you've got a market cap of 200 million Canadian dollars. Yes. And of course, your share price standing at $1.20. Yes, the reason we have so many shares is unfortunately, uh, when I came on board, uh, the company was uh, distressed financially. So we did have to raise some uh, some money back then and then we with that was attached some warrants some of the warrants have come due and they've been because we've been great at the share price they were exercising converted so that added to the share price but if you look at it in terms of market cap and not just the share count right a 200 million market cap for what I think we can do is very light if we do a deal with company ABC that's a multi-billion dollar company that stock's going to double or triple and if we get revenues or other companies, that stock would be, there's no reason why this couldn't be a multi-billion dollar company. Would you expect your company to be an income company or a growth company? <coughs> oh, I think, I think that uh, income or growth, I think it's, I guess it would be a combination of the two. The, the, the growth, because we want to license our I, IP, I think the you know the curve would be like this, and then sort of slowly. We're still pushing our own IP right now, so we can continue to develop a platform. I think it would be a combination of both. But yeah, certainly, from, certainly on a on, from a earnings multiple perspective, they they, they they like the ARM model. Yes. And the ARM model is is definitely a growth model. It's it has earnings multiple today of 81, so 81 times earnings, and that is certainly what we'd all like to see as shareholders of Poet. If Poet could, could uh, uh, capitalize on licensing agreements and say have recurring revenue of $25 million a year, let's just say, let's just throw the number out there, then you, you'd be looking at a $2 billion company as an example. And that's, and that's, 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 that's what we want as, as shareholders. I really believe, I mean, we are building this company to survive in the long term. But I can't believe if you can take a box that has eight chips in it and turn it into one or two chips, drop manufacturing costs by 60%. The, 
the other companies in that sector, which is a you know a 10, 15 billion dollar sector, can allow that technology to exist, right? I mean, you it's I've described it before. Acquiring poet is just like buying a put option on all the money you're going to spend on R and D anyway. Okay. Yes. Question for you again. You talked about this milestone that you need to achieve by March to, to create to engage this initial key and important yes. partnership. Um, how um, firm is your conviction that you're going to achieve those milestones? And if is there likely to be any form of delay? Obviously, hopefully not. But if there is some sort of delay and it's your first key partnership, would that cause a knock-on effect for your Nasdaq listing and all the things you've got? You know, plan for the rest of this year? So, uh, traditionally, from, and completely honest, traditionally from the lab, we're never on time. We, you know, we're, we, we, yes. we haven't come in early, and we've always come in a little bit late. But I, the lab is the lab, and you can't push you know, genius, if you will. Um, having said that, uh, that is not the only milestone that we're doing. We're also doing the 100 ring oscillator, with many other companies are waiting for those results. I believe that we're going to be right around that time frame. I've massaged the June time frame in terms of the NASDAQ listing, anticipating that we could have some delay in those things, because it's historically what we do. So it wouldn't surprise me if it came a little bit later. What's really crucial is to understand that the industry is asking for this from us. If we went back five years, we would have a hard time. You know, for a person like me, we just fell into this at the right time, because the industry is open to it, and because the technology is at a point in time where we actually can deliver the solution. The whole of tonight's spirit has been that you have a dynamic new way of producing semiconductors that makes every existing silicon semiconductor redundant or beat. Whose lunch are you aiming to, to, to eat? Is it Intel? Um, I, I think we could eat some lunch from the <coughs> sector. Certainly Intel, Intel would be the king that uh, would suffer the most if we go mainstream. But I think you can look at the optical electrical area, the convergence area. I think you can look at uh, sensors and arrays. Um, I think you can look at... Uh, can, yes? can I just add something? It's, it's not necessarily Poet that's looking to eat anybody's lunch, but you have industry players who could license Poet, yeah. and they'll eat their competitors' lunch, right? It's it's not Poet that's going out there to, and trying to destroy uh, the competition. It enables companies to destroy their competition, and and that's key. That's that's what's so elegant about this strategy. It's that they're simply going to license this technology to <coughs> companies that are going to go out and and make a lot of money yeah. by making devices that are not just incrementally better than what's out there today, but very much, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? A new paradigm. Yeah, a new paradigm <laughs> shift, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. So whose lunch will eat? I don't know. But the people who believe in innovation, who believe in disrupting the industry, they will eat the lunch of the big players today. They are going to be our partners. And they will eat maybe Intel's lunch or Samsung lunch. I am not going to specify. This kind of because we we won't we'll be getting the edge on the competition really at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah the earlier adopters, absolutely. Early adopters. Yeah. Um, I'd like to just thank Mike White and his yeah. colleagues Miranda. Yeah. I'd like to thank yeah. Stefan and Gene yeah. and Peter for coming down and presenting to us tonight. First public presentation. Of the Yeah, it does. That's right.